Right, hey guys, and welcome back to the crawl room. We're here once again in this wonderful ranty room for all things Formula One. So, the Hungarian Grand Prix has come to a close, and what could be said about that one? Well, it was a bit of a slow burner in the mid-stage, let's be honest. It wasn't the most thrilling thing to happen in the whole world, was it, in that middle phase of the race? But uh, towards the end, it was certainly spicing up with all the uh, on-track action and off-track action as well. So if you've never seen this series before, I award the drivers out of a maximum of 10 points based on their overall race weekend's performance, and I go all the way down to zero if they have a particularly bad one. Take a look out for bonus points, they're sometimes enough of some drivers to do something extra special during a race, and on the rare occasion I do award minus points to those drivers to do something extra special, but for all the wrong reasons. Let's take a look at the current Cruel Room standings, then going into this episode, it's on the screen now for you to take a look at. See where your favourite driver currently is in the standings and based on this weekend's performance all along, can you see them going up or can you see them going down? There's a hell of a lot to play for. We're reaching the halfway stage now of the season, of course. We've got one more round to go before the summer break. Uh, will some drivers even last beyond the summer break in real life? Who knows? Who knows? The team standings is on the screen for you as well to take a look at those. Again, this can be manipulated separately from the driver scores. However, it is the driver scores that are added or deducted together to produce the overall standings. And then the points at the side are what I've decided to add or minus that will be taken off at the end of the season to give us the overall team champion of the Cruel Room 2024. So without further ado, 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 let's kick things off with the race winner then, shall we? Oscar Pastry. What's your favourite pastry? Yeah, unbelievable stuff. Fantastic effort. McLaren have finally got their shit together, or have they? Or have they? This is the thing, isn't it? And I cannot believe it. Oscar Piastri, fantastic, fantastic stuff. Lining up P2 on the grid and getting a great launch off the line to nip it up the inside of his teammate Lando at the start. And then he led the race in a controlled manner. The first round of pit stops came. Lando got the first one to stop, he was the first one to stop to cover off the likes of Hamilton, Verstappen and uh, Leclerc behind, he did that fine no problem, and Piastri after he did his stop, came out just ahead second pit stop time came and once again, Lando was instructed to pit first, uh, before Oscar Piastri did because of the undercut threat from Hamilton behind again so they pitted Norris but then left uh, Piastri out for an additional two laps before deciding to pit Piastri and then that meant he came in behind Lando so he came out and he, he came in the pits in P1 came out the pits in P2 and uh, that meant that oh dear oh dear oh dear has he lost the win well according to McLaren no he hadn't it was all going to be sorted out and instructed towards the end of the race and it didn't look like it was going to happen, did it? It didn't look like the instructions were uh, going the way of Lando Norris. He was certainly listening to them, but he wasn't understanding them. A bit like uh, Vettel. Oh, I was really confused. I didn't understand in that moment when I was told not to overtake my teammate, and then I did it. I didn't quite understand what Multi-21 meant, you know. <laughs> A load of shit. Uh, but yeah, so... Uh, Norris it seemed to fall on deaf ears for about 10-12 laps and he was saying well if Oscar can catch up to me then I'll let him through and uh, as, as the, it, it was Oscar didn't have the pace in that second stint to match or keep up with uh, Lando Norris and slip behind so then when it came to five laps to go Norris was instructed basically get out of the way team order do it now do it now is what he said over the radio so he just lifted off off the straight let Oscar through and Oscar took the victory. So, how do I feel? I mean, I mean, you know, both these drivers, I may as well join together, to be honest, but I will talk about Lando individually in a moment. But uh, Oscar's race, really, was all about the start for him, and he nailed the start. He nailed that first stint. It was just towards the end. You know, after he'd had the first round of pit stops, that second stint phase... He had about a four-second cushion, he had a wide moment at turn 11, and then he had a gravelly moment at turn 12, and that gap from, from Piastri to Norris closed down to less than two seconds when uh, Norris came into the pits. So that was the cushion gone there. And then obviously after that second round of pit stops, we go into phase three of the race, and Piastri didn't have the pace to match or beat Norris. So it's a difficult one, isn't it? I think had they just pitted Oscar first... And then Lando second. Lando would have been safe from the overcut, undercut anyway of Hamilton. 
and he would have still come out behind Piastri. And then I think if Lando was on pace faster than Piastri, then he should have been allowed to overtake. That's how I see it. That's how I think McLaren should have done it. I think somehow they've managed to balls up a 1-2 here. It's, it's crazy, isn't it? But for me personally, I have no uh, qualms with them actually wanting Oscar to win. And I think if that's what was agreed behind the scenes before the race even began, then I'm all for the team order staying as it was, as in Oscar wins, Lando second. We've got a quick car here. Whoever's first into turn one wins the race effectively, providing there's no mishaps. Um, yeah, it was a it was a bad bad way of going around. It was a bad strategy of the way of going around it because you could have made it that Oscar was never behind Lando and you could have made it that Lando never had to concede the amount of time he did to let Oscar back through. And that's what kind of puts a dark cloud o over the whole situation, to be honest with you. But I don't want to take anything away from Oscar Piastri this weekend. He drove sublime. You know, lining up on the front row of the grid, a great move into turn one. The first stint, the second stint for the most part was great. And then just his race just tailed away from there. And he was very lucky that Lando Norris obeyed team orders and followed the instructions and did allow him through to take the victory. However, he did deserve it anyway. So for Oscar Pastry this weekend, I've gone for eight. I've gone for eight points to Oscar Pastry. Great weekend overall. I am just going to knock a point off for the scruffy end of the second stint that he had and the poor pace in the third stint, which meant he couldn't keep up with Lando. Um, for me personally, I think that's a fair score. I think he's done. A, he's had a good weekend. And uh, eight is fair for Oscar. Congratulations on your first victory, though, buddy. Seven wins this season now, which is the most wins in a single season by different drivers since 2012, where it was the first seven races won by seven different winners that season. That's how crazy that one was. Um, yeah, well done to uh, Oscar Pastry. It's eight on the board to you. And in second place, we come to Lando, Lando Norris. Why am I always the bridesmaid and never the brushing bride? Well, there you go. Uh, Lando Norris, once again, is a bridesmaid. But for good reason this time, we'll let him off, shall we? I do massively respect Lando for allowing Oscar back through. I know there was a lot of uh, shenanigans on the team radio for those like 10 laps or whatever it was. It felt like an eternity when it was like, well, you should have made sure that Oscar stayed ahead of me. You know, you should have done the pit phases around. I was comfortable. I was happy. You know, you, you decided to pit me first. This is what, what the situation is. Tell him to catch up. Well, he can't catch up, Lando. Well, then that's not my issue. I do understand that in, in certain aspects with Lando Norris, especially when Max Verstappen had a shocking race again. And I know it's an unrealistic gap to close, but that gap could close, you know. Max seems to have lost his head these last few races. The car's not got the pace. The Red Bull's not got the pace, I should say, compared to the McLarens at the moment. And, uh, yeah, there could be a, a mathematical chance going into the final race of the season. And every point counts. And he's given away seven this time around. So... Yeah, I can understand it from uh, Norris's point of view totally that I want to win and I want to get those points. I want to make up for the races I've lost already this season, like Silverstone due to poor strategy, like Austria due to me driving like a fool, you know, like Imola because I didn't push hard enough. It, it's it's one of those, isn't it? It really is. So for uh, Lando Norris this weekend, I've gone for nine. Nine points on the Cruel Room. I don't want to blame him too much. It was just turn one, wasn't it? Uh, that second phase, the stint, the, the start procedure, the second phase, he bogged down in second gear. That gave Oscar the chance, gave him the run up the inside of turn one, and that was that. But Lando, I wouldn't have been too overly critical had he decided to take the victory. Uh, I've, I've already worked out in my head. I was like, I was going to give Oscar ten if he if he finished second because I felt I would have felt sorry for him, and Os and uh, Lando would have probably given him about six or seven. Criticised him, but not harshly. Uh, but yeah, I've given him nine. Nine points to Lando. Uh, I think he did the right thing for the team. Yet he's going to be disappointed. Yet, in theory, he did deserve the win because that final stage, had they pitted them the right way around so they were 1-2 as they were all race and then said, you're free to race, that would have been Lando's win. So yeah, uh, Ash for Lando, but uh, takes it on the chin. There's a lot more races left this season. McLaren have got the pace. Nine points to Lando Norris. Third place, we come to Lewis Hamilton in the Mercedes. 
Well, he seems to have found his feet now, doesn't he, since Silverstone? That victory has certainly spurred him on because this was another cracking race by Lewis. Uh, I can't really say there was anything wrong with it. He drove really well. He kept the McLarens honest in the first stages of the race. He had good pace. Uh, he held off from Max Verstappen for quite a number of laps uh, after the pit stop window, uh, the first round of pit stops came through. In the second phase of the race, was holding off uh, Verstappen quite nicely, and then Verstappen just lunged up his inside like a lunatic and made contact with him. Was lucky he kept going, lucky not to have his car damaged, and then held off from the likes of Leclerc behind him as well in the Ferrari for P3 at the end. And, uh, yeah, it was all good, wasn't it? It was all good. He had a good race weekend overall. Good qualifying, good race pace. Good race overall by uh, Lewis Hamilton. I can't fault a thing, to be honest with you. I think he drove really well, drove really clever, and uh, got a podium that he rightfully deserved. Didn't have a match for the McLarens, but neither did any car this weekend. And, uh, yeah, put up some good, good fighting, good racing. No argues with, arguments with that at all. So I'm going to go for nine points. Nine points to Lewis Hamilton. He's really found his form this season. He's doing really well now. And uh, I hope we can keep this up. We've got we've got Belgium this this coming weekend. We've got uh, a summer break then, and I hope the summer break doesn't reset him to back to his old ways because this early phase of the season he's not been great, but this latter half of the season he's been a lot better. So yeah, for Lewis Hamilton, it's nine points this weekend after another cracking race, two races back to back that have been brilliant by uh, Lewis. Fair play to him. Fair play indeed. Nine to Lewis Hamilton, finishing in fourth place. We come to shot. La la, oh sacre bleu, sha la 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 la. Here he is picking up some points at long last after a couple of dismal races in the triple header not too long ago. Uh, yes, here he is, P4, was knocking on the door of a podium there and uh, couldn't quite get round Max or Lewis to be fair, but was in that DRS window and he did a great job. That, that final phase of the race where it was uh, Hamilton and Max battling. Leclerc wasn't too far behind to be able to close the gap. And the Ferrari didn't look to have the pace, did it? It was like four and five tenths off around the lap in qualifying. So they didn't look like there was going to be anything close to podium. So the fact he's finished P4 here is a great effort, a really good effort. Solid job by Leclerc and keeping Max and Hamilton honest towards the final stages while they were battling is very respectable. For Shalala, I've gone for nine points for Shalala as well. I think he's done a great job again this weekend. Uh, thankfully, the team orders and team strategy and things uh, went his way this time around. They didn't decide to stick him on Inters when it was a bone-dry circuit. Um, and uh, he didn't get any contact at the start, so he just drove his own race... And it almost came good for him. It almost became a podium. That moment where Max and Hamilton came together, that could have been both cars out, both cars had a puncture, both cars had damage. And it could have been P3, and he put himself in, in, in that position to get it. So, well done to Shalala. It's nine points to you. Finishing in fifth place, we come to Max for Strap-On. <laughs> Did you know, out of my 29 entries into Formula 1, I qualified for 19 races and reached the chequered flag at just 4 of those? What's even more amazing is that 3 out of those 4 races, I would have scored points based on the current F1 point system. Madness! And there we have it, Andrea Montemini of the week 2, Max from Strap On, for being a right little bitch. Uh, yeah, what... what what else could be said? What else could be said? Other than I'm knocking 20 points off as well. So it's minus 20. Minus 20 for Max Verstappen because he has driven like a burk. I am sorry, but his attitude on the radio stank all race. His race pace was good, but he was erratic. He was moaning. He was whinging. And he lunged up the inside of Lewis Hamilton like an absolute lunatic and crashed. He was lucky he kept going. He's lucky to finish here where he did. And I just think it's absolutely disgusting. Once again, we've seen this attitude from Max Verstappen. He's going back to his old ways because he can't win. Fuck's sake, mate. It's just unbelievable. It really is. I just cannot believe it how I thought Max was maturing and I thought, you know, he got this phase out of him. But no, it was just because he was winning it was easy. But the second he comes into combat, can't handle it. Second, his car's not quite doing what he wants, can't handle it. Second, he's not quite got the right strategy right, he can't handle it. 
It, it was just, I mean, it was just shouting at Jean Piero Lambiassi down the radio, was fucking moaning at him every five minutes. If I'd have been there, I'd just took the headset off and walked away. I'd have been like, yeah, see you later, mate. No worries, see you later. I'm not clearly not good enough for you. It, drive the fucking race yourself then. You know, he was even moaning as well, wasn't he, with the, in qualifying where it looked like it might have had a, a sprinkling of shower. He's like, we need to know with tyre temperatures and things. He like, was on edge all weekend. He was on edge. And once again, uh, the F1 commentary put it, you know, put it to him that he was like racing at two and three in the morning again on eSports uh, with his uh, red line racing eSports team and stuff, doing the touring cars or whatever he does on there. And I did, I do think I mentioned this a couple of races previous on the Cruel Room as well, where he was doing a a late night stint on a on an esports race and then thinking well is his commitment to formula one actually that much like i would be fucking fuming if i was a team boss and finding out that my racing driver who i've put all my eggs in one basket for this team for such a long time is up till three and four o'clock in the morning the rate the weekend of a race meeting th- th- and he's playing fucking games like yeah it doesn't sit right with me at all and i was glad that they made that observation because like i say i have made it before um yeah, I just don't know what to say about him. I mean, his attitude stank, didn't it? It absolutely stank. He is such an ungrateful twat. That's all I can say about him. He's just a bell end at the moment. He can't seem to get his act together at all. And it's just un- unacceptable. You don't speak to anyone like that. I mean, you, you've got to think of it as a situation of, oh, it's due to the moment, it's battle, it's combat, oh, blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry, but if I said half the stuff that Verstappen said to Lambiassi over the radio, if I said that to any sort of person that I worked for or with as a job, I wouldn't be in that job the next day, would I? Yeah? You see what I mean? It's as simple as that. Max Verstappen is a, a, an employee for Red Bull. Lambiassi is, a Red, is an employee for Red Bull. Lambiassi just says, I'm sorry, I can't work with that. I think, uh, you know, I think he's bullying me. You know, and then, then what do they do? Do we have to, do we have to fire... Uh, Max Verstappen or do we have to suspend him and put him on a tribunal period and then they have to do collect all the evidence that's what would happen in real life in any other situation Max Verstappen is paid millions to drive that car to the best of his ability regardless of what strategy is thrown at him they can work that out in the debrief and go yeah this is where we got it wrong Max we're sorry you know he has to drive it in a professional manner where he doesn't shout and scream down the team radio because he knows it's broadcast to all the world but he did it anyway and then he doesn't make stupid dive bombs and lunges that are never fully on. He'd massively outbreaked himself. He was never making that corner, ever, ever. And he says, well, Lewis turned right. Yeah, because I don't know if you were aware, Max, but there are a corner coming up. It was actually a right-hand bend. You'd totally miss that. So, yeah, Max Verstappen was moaning all weekend, whinging, 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 and I'm sick of it. So minus 20 and an of the week to Max Verstappen. That's going to be interesting, and that's going to affect the uh, team standings as well, because whatever the drivers score, the teams get. So I think that's going to send them down the order somewhat, but uh, tough shit. Uh, It's uh, piss poor at the moment at Red Bull. It really is. The attitude stinks, and they can't keep allowing Max Verstappen to get away with this attitude because uh, it's not acceptable. It's as simple as that. So, yeah, minus 20, and of the week, two, Max Verstappen. Next we come to Galos Science. Smooth operator. Smooth. Mmm. Ish. He did okay. He did okay, did uh, Carlos. He, he drove well, he drove smart, he didn't do anything wrong, we didn't see anything of him, but it wasn't as good as his teammate Leclerc. He tumbled away in the race itself. Had about a 10 second gap between himself and Leclerc at the end there, so not great considering you're in the same car, or very similar at least anyway. So I've gone for a solid 7.5 to Carlos Sainz. He's not done anything right or wrong this race weekend. I just think he's done what he could with the car he'd been given. But his his teammate Leclerc squeezed that little bit more out of it. So uh, it's as simple as that, really. It's as simple as that. 7.5 to Carlos Sainz. Next up, we come to Jago. Sergio Perez already disqualified on the cruel room, of course. So we don't really talk about his race. But once again, another disappointing and dismal qualifying in the Saturday session. Having a shunt. And then in the race, recovering here to P7. Respectable, respectable. But he's disqualified anyway. And he would have been getting an of the week had he not been disqualified for the shunt in qualifying, no matter what he did in the race. So, yeah, once again, get off the grid, check out. Uh, I don't think he'll be surviving much longer in Formula 1. Uh, Helmut Marko said he needs to deliver um, in Belgium or be out. So <laughs> we'll see how right Helmut Marko's words are. But uh, for now, 
yeah, that's that. And all said and done for Checo. Then we come to George, George, George of the Russell. Watch out for that Q1. Yeah, because he didn't make it past it either, did it? And was out qualified by Sergio Perez that stuffed it into the wall. Work that one out. I know, unbelievable, isn't it? So, yeah, George Russell lining up in P17 for the race. Uh, got past Perez initially and was doing all right, but then the way the stints and strategy fell, um, yeah, it was it was one of those, wasn't it? He just kind of tumbled behind the, the Red Bull and then that was it. So, here he is picking up a few points, which are crucial for Mercedes points tally. Should have been more, though. Uh, initially, he said it was on him, and then he started blaming the team. So, yeah, you know, it's one of those driver's excuses once again coming in, but at least he kept it respectable. And uh, didn't shout and scream and picked up a few points. So it's going to be 6.5 to George Russell. Probably generous by a point there, to be honest with you. But at least he did recover to score some points. Kept himself clean and tidy and learnt how to respect the team. And if he did have any criticisms, he didn't moan like a total bitch. So yeah, 6.5 to George of the Russell. Then we come to Yuki Sonoda, the first of the Visa Cash App Maxi Tampon RB Buy One Get One Freeze. Uh, yeah, what could be said for Yuki Sonoda's race weekend overall? Picks up a couple of points here after an impressive Q3 appearance. However, he did have that big shunt in qualifying, didn't he? And I do have to note that, I'm afraid. I do, I do, I do. Uh, picking up two points this race, look at the cars ahead. Is an RB expected to be any of those cars ahead? No, not really. And the cars he finished ahead of? Yep, yeah, absolutely. I think he did a good job there to hold off the Aston Martins at the end there, who were playing a strategic game to try and get ahead of him. So he held those off nicely. Good effort, good job. And picks up a couple of points for the team. Fair play. When his nearest rivals don't score points, it didn't look like they had that opportunity to do that this weekend. Picking up a couple of points is crucial. However, I do have to mark him down for that shunt in qualifying. So Yuki Snow is only getting six. Six points on the cruel room from me. That is harsh, I will admit, but he did crash. He did crash heavily, and it was lucky that he didn't sustain any like gearbox repair damage and engine penalties and things like that, because that was a smelly mess when it uh, arrived on the grass in bits, wasn't it? So... Yeah, Yuki Sonoda, I've knocked him off there basically four points because I think that was a perfect 10 weekend. Q3 and points, can't do anything more than that. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, he did have that shunt. So six points to Yuki Sonoda. Rounding out the final points paying positions, we come to Lance Stroll in the Aston Martin. Now we've got controversy here as well, haven't we, within the Aston Martin squad because Alonso was ordered to let Lance Stroll by. So he could have a go at Yuki Tsunoda. And if he couldn't get Yuki, then he was going to re-let Alonso through to take that final point. And he didn't do it. He didn't do it, did he? He didn't do it. But where it's different in McLaren, with Oscar and Lando trying to keep two drivers happy. At Aston Martin, it's not that at all. It's just, let's keep Daddy happy. Let's keep Son happy. Let's make sure Son and Daddy are happy. How are they going to be happy? Well, if Son scores points and a teammate doesn't, Daddy's happy. Daddy's happy. So, he finishes P10. He's not going to get punished or discredited or disrespected or anything for disobeying team orders in allowing Alonso back through for that final point because it doesn't matter because it's his own team. So... You know, you can't expect anything else, can you, from him? And I'm not going to hold it against him because this is just the way it is now. I'm kind of, I'm kind of bored of it, to be honest with you. I am just bored of it. So, yeah, it's seven to Stroll. I thought that was a weekend that was worthy of a seven. He didn't finish ahead of an RB that he should have done. The pace at the start of the race was respectable, and he did keep Alonso honest. In fairness, to be that close to Fernando, that's what I'm getting at. Normally, Lance Stroll is nowhere near his teammate, so team orders can't come into play. The fact that team orders have meant that the drivers have switched around anyway, it's irrelevant to me in this situation. It really is, because Stroll's always going to want those points, isn't he? Because he's a professional racing driver. Look at me, Daddy. Look at me. I'm a racing driver, Daddy. I know, son. I love you. If only I'd have had twins, I could have had two of my sons in that team, and we could have both been sharing the points. Wouldn't it have been fantastic? Oh, I know, Daddy. I know. Yeah, so there you go. That is Lance Stroll. Seven points from me. Uh, because, yeah, he disobeyed team orders, but don't give a shit because it's his team. And that's the end of that. Finishing just outside the points in P11, we come to Fernando Alonso. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha
I don't have many highlights in my F1 career, but driving that bright yellow 40 Ford was highlight enough for me. <laughs> and there we have it, and of the week to Fernando Alonso. And I can hear the cries in the comments section already. Why? Why, Josh? Why? Fernando Alonso is the most amazing driver, honestly. He was there when Jesus was racing in Formula 1 and he was a miracle worker. I know, I know, I'm sorry, but he just came into this weekend with a totally defeated and deflated attitude. And I wasn't really agreeing with it. I really wasn't. His, his free practice sessions weren't really feeding back well, were they? You know, like, oh, how was the balance on the car, Alonso? We need to feed back to the other, t to the other driver. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Is that feedback? Is that, is that feedback, Alonso? Yeah, he just, he's just, these last couple of race weekends, I mean, I, I can understand his frustration, you know, they had a podium finishing car last year regularly, you know, and it looked like they'd lost the way in the middle of the phase of the season last year, but then sort of came good again towards the end, so he was hoping that it was going to be sort of good again and respectable. It's not been that way at all. There's talks as well as that uh, Alonso's not being listened to, and it's Lance Stroll's feedback that they're taking more when it comes to the car and its performance, and that's why that's closing the deficit between Alonso and Stroll, because he's been tailored to more of Stroll's driving style. But again, he should have known all of this before he signed for a team whose son's in the second car. You know, Alonso, yeah, I love the guy, don't get me wrong, but these last few races have been incredibly frustrating to watch. And it's just got to the point where it's just a bit inexcusable now, because you, you're already frustrated with the situation you're in, in terms of the car's not as good as it should be. I get that, I totally get that. Then you're frustrated at the side, the, the fact, well, they seem to be taking Stroll's feedback more seriously than mine. Again, it's probably just hearsay, there probably is some truth to that, to be fair, but... Just taking it from Alonso's perspective, you've got those two things on your mind. The last thing you want to be doing in that situation is acting like you don't give a shit about anything because they're just more likely to listen to Stroll more and they're more likely to go with Stroll's feedback for the upgrades that you know don't work on your car. You know, if you're if you're in a defeated attitude and just like, yeah, whatever, I'm not, I'm not asked. Oh, how were, that, how were that Alonso? Is that okay? Yeah. But you got any more out of it? No, I don't know. Well... Where's, the, where's that going to get you? Where's that going to get you in life? It's not, is it? It really isn't. So, yeah, Alonso has been given an of the week for his just general downbeat attitude. And while I can understand it, and while I can accept it, that's not going to get the performance level of that car any better. And he's not going to suddenly be cheering up, is he? Because we're not going to turn up to Belgium now with that kind of feedback he's been given to the team and that kind of not giving a shit. He's not going to suddenly then turn up to Belgium and be a podium finisher. You need to be approaching the team and say, look, guys, listen to me. Please listen. I know what the problem is. It's X, Y, Z. Look, just trial it in Spa. If it doesn't work, I'm happy to revert back to the other previous update or revert back to the previous setup. But just trust me, guys, it's X, Y, and Z on my car that I need to get the most out of it. And then when he gets a Q3 appearance and a top five finish, he's like, look, I told you guys, right, summer break coming up now. We can get it sorted. You know, we've got two weeks in the workshop. Let's push, push, push. We can really come back strong in the second half of the season. That's what he needs to be doing. That's what he needs to be doing. But he's not. He's just... <laughs> not good enough. So, of the week, two, Fernando Alonso. <laughs> Next up, we come to Daniel Ricciardo in the second of the Visa Cash App. Maxi Tampon, RBs, Minardi, Toro Rosso, buy one, get one freeze. Uh, what a historic name. Prestige, just on the tip of your tongue with that spicy bastard. But yes, nonetheless, Daniel Ricciardo is getting six points. Same as his teammate, because Ricciardo does deserve six this weekend. A Q3 appearance, but couldn't convert it into the points. His teammate did, of course, convert it into the points, but he did have a shunt in qualifying. Ricardo didn't. Ricardo drove a decent race here. Could he really have been expected to finish ahead of the Aston Martins? It'd be nice to see him finish ahead of one because then that strategic play at the end uh, to try and attack Sonoda between the two Astins wouldn't have come to fruition. But uh, as it was, P12, respectable finish. It was the sixth best car, so in theory this is where it should be. And uh, that's that really. So yeah, a solid six to Daniel Ricardo, A decent weekend but could have been more based on where his teammate finished.
Next up we come to Nico Olkenberg in the first of the Hassers in an unlucky for some P13. Uh, yeah, this is sort of the best they could have done this weekend really. Olkenberg qualified himself in P11, didn't get a good start off the line, tumbled to about 14th. Went for an early pit stop on lap 3, took off the mediums, put on the hards and you thought well that's a decent strategy, it's got him up there but of course... The tyre life is very crucial around Hungary and when everyone else pitted later so came out behind him they were eventually able to chip the way through. The Aston Martins were the first to get through and then they were away and gone. So the strategy didn't quite work out well enough but I could understand why they did it because if you had a safety car or anything you'd then got trapped position to pit and get a free pit stop already ahead of the cars that you were previously behind. So I do understand why they did it, it just didn't work out their way at all this race. P13, realistically looking at the pace of that RB and the Astins, I would say it was fair. I would say it was probably about the right position for him this weekend. It would have been nice to see him closer to the points, maybe ahead of Ricardo, maybe ahead of Alonso or Stroll as well. But I always think points were going to be a stretch when you've got all the cars finishing ahead that you sh that should finish ahead of you anyway. You know, once you get those top four teams locked in, it looked like the fifth fastest car was shared between Aston Martin and RB, you're the 6th, 7th fastest car. Points are always just going to be that little bit too out of reach, unfortunately. But for Nico Walkenberg this weekend, it's a solid 7. Solid 7 this weekend. It's not been a wonder drive that we've seen in the previous couple of races for him, but still solid enough. Um, points would have been a stretch, but maybe, just maybe, had he had a better launch off the line, he could have been a bit closer to him. 7, Sir Hulkenberg. P14, we come to Alex Albon, qualifying himself in P13, finishing P14. Again, there's not really much that could be said about Alex's race. Didn't have the pace for points this weekend, did that car, but finishes ahead of a Haas and uh, an Alpine, and I guess that's okay. There's not really much else he could have been expected to do this weekend when the top four teams lock in the top eight positions, and he certainly wasn't the fifth fastest car. So that's all said and done, unfortunately. Alex Albon gets 6.5 from me. I think that's a fair and respectable effort. Been nice to see him get ahead of Haas Olkenberg, maybe. That would have been a nice uh, little Brucey bonus for him. But four places away from the points. Seems about fair from where they were this weekend. 6.5 to Alex Albon. Then we come to Kevin Magnussen in the second of the Hassers. Uh, his weekend, 15th in qualifying, not as good as his teammate, but had a great launch off the line. Uh, so he was in P10 in the early phases of the race, but went for a late-ish stop compared to all the others, and he lost a hell of a lot of track position. He fell behind a load of cars. He was behind the two Alpines. He was behind Bottas as well in the Sauber at one stage. The pit stop when they decided to pit him was like a nothing strategy from Haas. It was really confusing. Uh, they could have done more with him. Had they pitted him earlier, he could have come out with his teammate and been a bit closer to the top 10. But as it was, they put him on a nothing strategy. He got stuck in a load of traffic. And that really just ruined his race, sadly. So, yeah, not a good, not a good stop by Magnussen. But that wasn't his fault. That was the Haas strategy. But he had a great launch off the line to get himself into P10. Again, points weren't going to be possible really, but around that 12th, 13th area would have been probably the best they were going to do. So for uh, Kevin Magnus, I've gone for a solid six. Solid six this weekend for K-Mag. Uh, pointless than his teammate, just for the qualifying deficit. Once again, a few positions were crucial. He did make it up in the race, however, but he was in a compromised strategy from then on. Six to K-Mag. Then we come to Valtteri Bottas in the first of the stake kick me up the ass Saubers. Uh, Valtteri this weekend, I am going to say, was shafted. Royally shafted by his strategy. You watch that race back, and I know Mr. Anonymous, and he's not been doing much this race or this season at all, but you take a look at Valtteri Bottas, and I think you'll see that he was actually really good this race. He was P12 in qualifying, which is a great effort. He was running round in and around that area, P11, P12. Then he had a later stop than Kevin Magnussen, and Kevin Magnussen race, race was ruined by a late stop, but he had a later stop than Magnussen, but not enough to have a good enough tyre deficit on the cars around him. Came out at the back behind his teammate, Joe Guan Yu, who was trundling around the back all weekend. That's how bad that pit stop strategy was by the Sauber squad I don't know what the hell they were playing at were points possible? No but was he the 6th fastest car this weekend? I think so, I think there was a P11 P12, somewhere around there kind of finish on the cards there for Bottas and had it gone wrong with Hamilton and 
Verstappen actually like both being out, that could have elevated him to, into the points. So, yeah, Bottas, I think, was shafted this weekend, unfortunately, by his team, by a very poor strategy. So he's getting seven points from me. Seven for Valtteri. That was a fair effort. Respectable qualifying. Respectable first stint of the race. And then screwed by strategy. And I mean screwed. Watch that race back and just watch Bottas. Because I said I was going to do that, didn't I? Because he always seems to be missing out on of the weeks when he deserves them. But there's more things going on in the race. I watched Bottas like a hawk. And I was like, why have they done that? I think Bottas needs a little bit of respect for that race. And that's why he's getting a solid seven on the crawl room. Next up, of course, we come to Logan Sargent in the second of the Williams. Disqualified on the crawl room anyway. And, yeah... Just another one of those weekends, very lonely weekend by Sargent. Did respectable in qualifying, but then that was about that. So yeah, we don't talk about his race anyway, but uh, yeah, not an impressive one to be keeping his uh, race seat for more than the uh, second half of the season. Another driver at risk. Will he make it past Belgium? Who knows? <laughs> There's four weeks to decide after next week, and uh, I think there might be a couple of drivers uh, getting their P45s. <laughs> Next up we come to SD, SD Bestie, oh God, SD, SD Bestie to you, ain't like SD Bestie, oh God. Well, what could be said for SD Bestie this weekend? It's a middle row five team, sort of treat him as a retirement. I don't know what they were playing about in Q1, but they decided they weren't going to go back out as the track was evolving, so they ended up down at the back anyway. Alpine have just got this team that just look like, oh, they look like they're making some progress, and then they're like, oh, no, 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 no. Let's line up on the back row of the grid, lads, shall we? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I don't really know what that was all about, but uh, yeah, the race itself, he was compromised with a poor qualifying that wasn't his fault. And then the race itself... Yeah, here he is. I don't really know what happened to him. Not really interested. Mid row 5 2, SD Bestie. Then, last of the runners, we come to Joe Guan Yu in the second of the stake, kick me up the arse, Saubers. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be an of the week on the crawl room. I thought I was so anonymous that even the moaning Yorkshireman would forget about me. And there we have it. Of the week, Andrea Montamini of the week to Zhou Guan Yu for being absolutely pathetic this race weekend once again. Lining up towards the back of the grid in P18. Stunning. Stunning effort, Joe. Stunning. Uh, had a spin in free practice one that nearly took Perez out, didn't it? That was quite an interesting moment. He just kept pirouetting. That was fun. Uh, and then in the race itself, dog shit race pace, down at the back, trundling around, doing nothing at all. Absolutely pathetic. So yeah, Zhou Guan Yu deserves a of the week to him. I think that puts him close to disqualification now, but I'll uh, have a look and check at the scores soon. But I know he's not disqualified just yet, but he is getting close to it. So he could he be the next one to join the pile? It's ever growing, isn't it? That's for sure. So there we have it then, yes, a of the week to Zhou Guan Yu. And last but by no means least, we come to Pierre Gasly, the first and only retirement in the race. As always with the retirements, I can only score him a maximum of five points, and a maximum of five is what he is getting. Uh, because, once again, another retirement, he, he didn't even take part in the last race, did he, last time out? Jesus Christ. And this time around, had to retire with a hydraulics issue. Uh, the race itself, obviously, once again, Alpine didn't decide to go out for another run in Q1, which compromised their qualifying substantially. Lined up on the back row of the grid, elected to do a pit lane start and change a load of components overnight. And then, obviously, something in those components broke down, which is pretty much what happened last time as well, didn't it? So, yeah, but boxed and retired after about 20-odd laps. It was a pathetic effort, really, by Alpine once again. But no fault of Pierre Gasly. So it's a maximum of five a retirement can score. And uh, that's that, I'm afraid. Gasly... What a shocking season. So there we go then, guys. Those were the runners and riders of the Hungarian Grand Prix. Let me know down in the comments section if I scored any drivers too high, any too low. The updated standings with the scores I have just awarded are on the screen now for you to take a look at. And my, oh, my, hasn't Max Verstappen taken a tumble, but rightfully so. 
deservedly so after what was a pathetic effort by him. Really needs to book his ideas up and sort himself out. Really looking forward to seeing what the comments section actually say about not just that, but about the team orders at McLaren, the situation at Aston Martin. There's a lot, there's a lot of talking points going into this summer break, isn't there? It's going to be really interesting to see what people's thoughts and opinions are on it. Take a look at the team standings as well. That'll be on the screen for you now to have a look at. And it is Red Bull down at the bottom now. Oh dear. So unfortunately, whatever the driver score is what the team score. So uh, yeah, that's fun, isn't it? Red Bull down at the back after, well, Sergio Perez not doing anything, can't score any more points. So they're already down to one car with Verstappen. And then Verstappen, uh, their only dr point scoring driver, not just in real life, but in the cruel room anyway, drives like a knob. It's not going to end well for you, is it? But uh, yeah, I can influence this somewhat. I could add those 20 points back on at the end of the season if I wanted to. I could deduct more from them if I wanted to. I could do whatever I wanted with any of these teams. And uh, yeah, for now, that's how the order stands. But the points have got to come off the ones that you can see with the minus scores at the side of them. And I'm a plus points towards the end of the season as well to get a champion. So a massive thanks as always goes out to Dan, formerly of Mushy Gaming of course. Currently under Dan Bartler for providing me with the scoreboard that you see on your screen. The driver icons in the corner of your screen and for the intro. Without him this series would be more pointless than it already is. And who can forget Dave, F1 Games PlayStation, for providing me with the of the week's that you don't necessarily know yet, but you know you're going to love them. That's one thing for sure. We've got an exciting one coming up for next time out as well. A massive thanks as always goes out to those guys. And a massive thanks goes out as always to you guys for watching. Thanks so much for the continued love and support with not just this series, but the channel as a whole. I'll see you all next Tuesday for the Belgium Grand Prix Cruel Room. That's going to be a spicy one, isn't it? Looking forward to that. And then we go into the summer break. And uh, there's plenty of content coming up in between as well. So look forward to that. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and as always, much love.